Okay, so welcome everyone um, the, to the Riverwood Conservancy's webinar, Greening Our Community with Credit Valley Conservation. Um, my name is Stephanie Keeler. I'm the Community Program Coordinator at the Riverwood Conser Conservancy. Um, I'm hoping you're doing well and staying safe. Before we get to today's presentation, I would just like to mention that all of our March events are now live at the riverwoodconservancy.org. Um, so you can go there to sign up for our webinars and other programs as well. A special thanks to Credit Valley Conservation for making these programs possible, not only this program, but all of our other discovery programs we've had the past couple of months. If you have the financial means today to support our programming, please give at the riverwoodconservancy.org. And today we have Kyle Menken speaking. Kyle is a technician with the Integrated Water Management Team at Credit Valley Conservation. Kyle's educational background is in philosophy, classical studies, and public relations. His current focus is writing, editing, and developing guidance documents, studies, and reports with the aim of improving the business case for low impact development implementation on private property. If you have questions for Kyle throughout the presentation, or you can keep it to the end, uh, you can type them in the Q&A tab in Zoom or in the chat box as well. Or if you are watching on Facebook, you can comment down below and I'll get to those as well and bring them to Kyle. So Kyle, I will turn everything over to you. Thanks so much for joining us. All right, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, and welcome everybody to our webinar. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the work that my team and I do uh, to bring natural infrastructure for stormwater management to our community. So how we green our community with natural infrastructure. So first, I'll just take you through the agenda for the day. Um, I'm going to give a very short introduction to Credit Valley Conservation. I'm sure most of you are familiar with us, but I just want to make sure that everyone is. Then I'm going to go and I'm going to give a bit of context by talking about the history of stormwater management in Ontario and in the greater Toronto area specifically. I'll then talk about today's topic, natural infrastructure for managing stormwater runoff. I'll talk about some of the work my team and I have done to build the fiscal and environmental case for widespread adoption of natural infrastructure. Uh, and then I'll get into a couple slides where I direct you to resources at Credit Valley Conservation, uh, which can help you to improve your property's stormwater management functionality. Uh, and then we'll get to some questions. So I hope to go for a talk for about 40 minutes, uh, not too much longer just to leave enough time for, for questions. Okay, first, uh, Credit Valley Conservation is a community-based environmental organization dedicated to managing, restoring, and protecting the natural resources of the Credit River watershed. So in this image here, you can see the Credit River and then you can see its watershed. So the watershed, it's an area of land, all the rain that falls into this green area here eventually finds its way into the river and then eventually finds its way into Lake Ontario. So that's what the watershed is. Uh, we've been uh, established since 1954 and we're one of 36 conservation authorities in Ontario. And we're the primary scientific authority for the watershed, its health, uh, and so on. And we work with, you know, municipal government, schools, businesses, and community organizations to deliver locally based programs. Okay, so what do we do? And there are two kind of themes behind what a lot of Credit Valley Conservation does, not all of it. But I do just want to go through these two themes with you. First, we connect people with nature. So we manage conservation areas, uh, which I know for a lot of people have been a great respite as we've gone through the last year. Most of them are in the upper watershed. I very much encourage you to look them up and to visit them when you can. Uh, we educate students, we run volunteer programs, and we host family-friendly events. So the image you see here in the photo uh, is of a, a sugar maple tree that's been tapped for making maple syrup. Sadly, we weren't able to do our annual Maple Syrup Fest this year. We're hoping that's possible next year, and I very much encourage you uh, to consider attending. Next, we connect science with action. So as I said, CBC is the primary scientific authority on the watershed. We monitor and one of the ways is we go around looking for what are indicators. So the image you see in the top here on the right is actually a stonefly, which is an insect that's very sensitive to water quality conditions. It needs cool, so the monitoring team find one of these, they get pretty excited. 
Um, another thing that excites them are brook trout, which you can see uh, down in the picture on the bottom right. So in addition to monitoring watershed health, we protect the watershed's drinking water. We work with landowners to improve their properties uh, and we improve stormwater management. And that's what I do and what my team does. So what is stormwater runoff? Uh, the image you see on your left uh, is an aerial view from above a forest. And the image on your right is an aerial view from above an urban area. And I want you to just think what's going to happen to rain which falls on the forest compared to what happens to rain that falls on the urban area. And the big difference between them is the natural areas are soft and can hold a lot of water, whereas the urban areas are full of hard surfaces, roads, roofs, driveways, uh, any gravel, gravel parking lots, things like that. So water just runs off them. What this does is it drastically alters the natural water cycle. And the image you're looking at here has three components. There's the natural water balance, the urban water balance, and a water balance that's been re-naturalized using natural infrastructure. And here, this acronym WSUD means water sensitive urban design. And I'll get into the problems with terminology that we have in the field in a couple slides. But basically, imagine you have the same amount of precipitation over that forest that I showed you. Most of the water that falls in a natural area, forest area specifically, is used by plants for transpiration. So the plants take it up through the roots, goes out through the leaves, this allows them to process the air uh, and draw carbon out of it so they can build their tissues uh, and then they release oxygen. So most water that falls in an urban area ends up as a vapotranspiration is the term that scientists use for it. The next thing that I want to point your attention to is this blue arrow here, uh, which is infiltration. So infiltration, again, the, the scientific term for water that penetrates the ground surface. And this water either goes into shallow groundwater or deep groundwater. Once it's in the ground, unless there's a plant to take it out, it stays there and then ends up flowing towards rivers. Um, so that's the second one. The third one, and this is the important one for today's, well, today's topic, is, is runoff. So runoff only occurs in urban areas for very big storms that saturate the ground surface such that it can't take in any more water. And then that water flows downhill to the nearest point where it can either get into the ground or it enters into a river. So these blue arrows are the natural state. So moving to an urban area, it's very different. You get a the same amount of precipitation, let's assume. And what happens is because of all these hard surfaces, most of this water ends up becoming runoff. So you get very low amounts of runoff in natural areas and very high amounts of runoff in urban areas. And what my team does is work to promote the widespread use of natural infrastructure for stormwater management, which brings us over to the images on the right. So what we're really trying to do is to reduce that amount of runoff, to clean it, to cool it, and to store it. Um, so that's what my team does. We use natural infrastructure to help restore a natural water balance. Okay, so next slide. What I'm going to do now is just take you through a brief history of sewers because it's really important for understanding why we have the problems that we have with stormwater um, and what the scale of those problems is. So in the olden days, um, before there were sewers of any kind for stormwater or for wastewater, what you had was people would just dump their waste into the street. So this is an image that is readily available on the internet. You find it everywhere. It's a photo, it's a picture of a woman dumping her chamber pot onto the roadway, quite literally on top of people's heads. Um, this is the way things were done before they had sewers. And there are obvious issues with this. The major one was cholera outbreaks. So what people started doing to deal with this public health problem is they'd go under the roadway here, build a sewer, and then connect a pipe from each house or building into that sewer so that the waste could go into that sewer rather than onto the road. This is a very positive step <laughs> in public health. Um, next slide. So what happened after this is people realized, okay, let's also take the rainwater that falls on our cities and direct that into the same sewer that carries our wastewater. And what you get Basically, up until you know the 1950s and the 1960s, the dates are a bit fuzzy because it changes from municipality to municipality. But what you get pre-1960s generally are combined sewers. 
and combined sewers carry both wastewater and stormwater. Now these combined sewers are a problem and here's why. Oh, I'll go back. Um, what you get are combined sewer overflows. So it's worth noting in Mississauga, there are no combined sewers and I don't think that there are many if any in our watershed. But what happens uh, here in the city of Toronto where I live is you get all the rainwater going into the combined sewer system. It all flows downhill to a wastewater treatment plant, which is before the lake. And there's so much water that's coming in all at once that they have to release that water into the lake untreated. So you get untreated sewage in, 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 in Lake Ontario. And they have to do this because or else the sewer system backs up and floods people's homes. So combined sewers can be very problematic for this reason. And, you know, people started realizing this, you know, 50s, 60s, and they started making changes. And rather than building one sewer for both stormwater and wastewater, they started building a sewer for wastewater and a sewer for stormwater. And again, this at the time was a very positive step. So generally, if you're in an area that was built between 1960 and 1980, you'll have these kind of simple sewer systems that are separate from wastewater systems. And here's how they work. Water enters catch basins. We're all familiar with what those are. Uh, it enters the catch basin. It then shoots very quickly through a pipe to an outfall, which then discharges this water into a creek where it reaches the Credit River in Lake Ontario. So these sewer systems are very simple and there's nothing in between the catch basin and the river, right? So it just flows very quickly along a pipe without any water quality treatment or without any storage for water, water quantity treatment. So if you're, if you're just shooting the water straight into the river without cleaning it and without storing it. So at this point, what I want to do is just bring up a map of development ages in the greater Toronto area. So this area in light green that you see here, we've got the city of Toronto in the middle, Mississauga and Brampton on the left. This uh, light gray area is the extent of development prior to 1981. So all of this area, when it was built, initially had those simple sewer systems that I just talked about, or combined sewer systems, which are mostly in the city of Toronto. So all that area has no stormwater management treatment. Or, you know, we've been bringing it, stormwater management to it in bits and pieces, and I'll talk about that in a bit. But for the most part, that's the scale of the problem that we have. And just fast forward to 2011, these are the areas that were built in what's called the stormwater pond area. Um, so before I get to this talking about stormwater ponds, I just want to talk about the issues that you get from stormwater in areas that don't have stormwater management control. So all these areas built prior to 1981, roughly. So you get water quality problems. Um, stormwater runoff from urban areas carries a lot of sediment. Uh, this sediment is problematic because it changes the natural transportation of sediment through the river. So by adding all this extra sediment, uh, you kind of choke the river out. When you've got a lot of sediment in it, water can't penetrate, and then the plants that live in the, in the river uh, can't use sunlight to grow, uh, and that's, that's a big problem. Other pollutants are a major concern as well. Um, you get oil, or you get grease, you get gas, you get heavy metals. So for instance, every time you press your brakes when you're driving, um, that erodes the brakes and that brake dust kind of settles onto the roadway. The rain comes along and washes it into the sewer and it goes straight into the, into the river uh, or the, the lake as the case may be. Um, as we'll see later on, urban areas are also very warm. They absorb the heat from the sun's rays. Uh, and this means that the, the stormwater runoff in urban areas is often very hot. And because it's very hot, uh, it makes it less, it makes the river less nice for species that I mentioned earlier, like stoneflies and brook trout. Finally, you get nutrients. So these are uh, minerals like, I think they're minerals. Uh, you get things like phosphorus and nitrogen. And phosphorus and nitrogen are two things that plants need to survive. But when you get too much of it all at once into a, into a body of water, what happens is you get an algae bloom. The algae says, there's food everywhere, let's eat it all. So they do, 
uh, they grow very fast in very big quantities. And then when they've exhausted all the phosphorus or nitrogen, they die. And when they die, they decompose and this removes oxygen from the water. So every summer you go to the lakeshore in the city of Toronto and I, I don't know too much about Mississauga in this respect, but you go to the lakeshore in the city of Toronto um, and you get these dead zones. There's just no fish there. I try to go fishing sometimes. You won't find any because all the water has had the oxygen pulled out of it because of nutrient pollution. Next problem is erosion. So I mentioned earlier, water goes in the catch basin, down a pipe to an outfall and into the creek. What this means is you get large volumes so huge amounts of storm water that gets sent into the river or creek at a very quick rate. So it happens all at once. The, what this means is you get a lot of problems with erosion. So all the water comes through very fast and it eats away at the riverbanks. This picture is actually taken by me uh, at Meadowvale Conservation Area after we had a flood event in 2018. And this thing, this picture that you're seeing here used to be a pathway through the park. The water came through so fast and with such force that it ripped up the pathway and spread you know, tons of gravel all around the conservation area. And it's difficult to see the scale here. This hole is three or four feet deep. This happened in a couple of hours. So, you know, erosion is a big problem. Municipalities spend a lot of money trying to solve erosion problems. Next, we have flooding. Um, so this is an image that was taken by uh, one of my colleagues. And this happened after a pretty normal summer storm at a commercial property. Uh, in Mississauga. And, you know, this is a nuisance. Somebody had to get to that car <laughs> after the rain and drive away and they probably got their feet wet. So, you know, flooding can be a nuisance. Flooding can cause damage. Flooding can cause harm to people's well-being. Um, you know, one, if your home gets flooded by sewage, that's a big problem. It causes a lot of money to fix and it might mean that you can't even live there. Water can also get in through people's window wells and cause basement flooding that way. So da water damage is a big thing uh, that results from flooding. And it can also harm people's well-being. It threatens our health, it threatens our safety, um, and it threatens our mental health. Um, my dad grew up, when I was growing up, our, our basement flooded regularly, and let me tell you, it did not help. <laughs> he had to look after me, my brothers, and, and yeah, it, uh, it was a hard thing for him to do. And I'll just point out here, part of CDC's mandate is to protect people in their property from natural hazards. So one of the things that we do is we monitor conditions to try to predict when floods will occur and communicate this information to our municipal partners and other media. Um, when it does happen, a flood event occurs, we all scramble and everybody gets in cars and goes around and tries to figure out what exactly is happening so we can warn people if we need to. So that's a major part of what CDC does. Um, the next slide, I'll just show you here. Um, these are what are called heat maps that show the amount of rainfall or precipitation that were dropped by huge storms in Southern and Central Ontario over the last 20 years. So many of you will remember we had significant flooding in the GTA uh, in 2013 on July 8th. Uh, and that's this image down here on the right. So you can see the pink says that 25 millimeters of rain fell. The orange says that 50 millimeters of rain fell. And the darker pink shows that 100 millimeters of rain fell. So you can see here, this is the city of Toronto going all the way up to the Niagara Escarpment and west over into Milton, Brampton area. Um, it was a huge amount of rain and it caused oh, nearly a billion dollars uh, in insured flood damages. If you count non-insured flood damages, the number is much higher. Um, and you can see some other storms here too. Peterborough had terrible flooding in 2004, Elmira in 2004, Burlington in 2014, and Stony Creek in 2005. I will draw your attention here to this storm here. This actually happened over Lake Ontario. Uh, and this one actually has a brown band in it, which means that 200 millimeters of rain fell. If this storm had happened, just slightly north and west of there, uh, it would have been big problems in Burlington, Oakville, and Mississauga. So that was a near miss, and hopefully we don't get a storm like that in the future because it would be very damaging. Okay, so back to our story. So these issues all motivated people, so water quality, erosion, and flooding, 
motivated municipalities to say, okay, we have to deal with these problems. And the main kind of tool that they used was to require that new development build stormwater ponds to manage their stormwater. So the stormwater, remember I said catch basin, pipe, river. In these areas, built from 1980 to the present, the stormwater ponds are still being built, you got a stormwater pond in the middle. Right, so what the stormwater pond is, it does, it takes the water and allows it to slow down and then pollutants settle to the bottom of the pond. Uh, what this means is you remove the pollutants and then the water, cleaner water flows out of the pond and into the receiving waterway into the creek or river. Um, and it releases this water slowly to prevent erosion and flooding. So stormwater ponds are, are very good development. They do have two issues though that I want to bring up here. First, the water in them gets very, very warm because they're just directly exposed to the sun's rays. Uh, and what this does is it heats up water in the receiving waterways, so in our creeks and rivers. And this can make life very difficult for those species that need cool, clean water to survive. Um, part of what my team and our partners at Toronto Region Conservation Authority and Lake Simcoe uh, Region Conservation Authority are doing is figuring out ways to cool water before it leaves uh, stormwater ponds so that we don't have this issue to the same extent. The next major thing that I want to point out is that these ponds are very expensive to clean out. In order to clean them out, and you have to after about 20, 30 years, you have to take all the water out of it. You got to get a big excavator in, and then you got to take all of the very polluted sediment, put it in a truck, and then dispose of it safely. Uh, and this is very expensive. Again, stormwater ponds started being built in the GTA, let's say around 1980. Um, and all those ponds are just right now needing to be maintained. So it's costing municipalities a large amount of money. Um, and this is one of the reasons why you see more and more municipalities developing stormwater charge programs. I'm happy to answer questions about stormwater charge and credit programs uh, at the end. Okay, so I said ponds are good, but they're not the greatest, right? What we try to do is bring natural infrastructure for managing stormwater. That's what me and my team does. And really this movement started picking up steam in the early 2000s and it's continuing through today. So part of the issue that we have with talking about natural infrastructure for managing stormwater is that it has so many different names. People call it low impact development. Uh, it's also called uh, water sensitive urban design, green infrastructure, green stormwater infrastructure, and so on. The basic idea behind all of them is the same. So I do wanna point out there's, there's natural infrastructure, which is like wetlands and forests and other natural areas that grew up you know, and was developed without too much human intervention. What the type of natural infrastructure that my team focuses on is built natural infrastructure. So you get an engineer, you design it, and then you build it. So it's things that we build to mimic nature's processes by helping to restore a natural water balance. So whatever the name is, this is the key idea. You're trying to restore a natural water balance by reducing runoff by allowing that water to uh, transpirate to be used by the plants or allowing it to get into the ground through infiltration. There are several different types. There's all kinds of different types of natural infrastructure for stormwater management, and I'll get to a few of these types in a minute, but the basic principles are the same for all of them. And here's what the principles are. You want to slow runoff down. You want to allow the ground to soak it up and you want to keep it cool and you want to keep it clean. So the images that you're seeing here, uh, these are actually from the same house from different sides. And this was a project that my team was part of uh, in the mid, you know, maybe 2015, 2016. And you can see this is the pre-photo and this is the post-photo. We helped this landowner build a rain garden to manage stormwater runoff from their rooftop. So this roof up here, which you can't see, would drain down into this downspout from where it flows across the lawn and the driveway and then down into the road, which is down here. What we did is we built a garden to perform all of the functions that I have up at the top. So you can see here, now this downspout goes into our rain garden. Uh, it's got rocks here, this slows the water down. It's got soils and mulch and plants, which helps the ground to soak the water up. 
we keep the water cool by putting it in the ground and keeping it away from the sun's rays. And the soils themselves and the plants themselves will hold the pollutants that I mentioned earlier that are of such concern. So rain gardens are a very good way uh, to improve your property's ability to manage its stormwater runoff. And I'll be getting to that uh, in a little bit. Okay, so very briefly, just some different kinds of natural infrastructure. Um, again, they all have the same principles and there's a lot of different ones, but I just wanna mention a few to set up some points that I'm going to make later. Um, so this image is of what's called a bioswale. So you have special soil and you dig a swale, a ditch, and then the water runs through it. And it, the, because it's got a special soil, water can infiltrate. And because it's got grass, it will give you some evapotranspiration. So this is a way to move stormwater from one location to another while cleaning it, cooling it, soaking it up, and slowing it down. Next, uh, this is a photo of what are called infiltration chambers. And really what they are, they're big old chambers underneath the ground that sit between the catch basin and the creek, right? The water goes in the catch basin through a pipe into these chambers and it holds all this water to prevent flooding and erosion. And it also allows this water to infiltrate because you'll often have a gravel layer at the bottom. Um, so water sinks into that gravel layer from where it infiltrates into the ground. And so things help to restore a natural water balance, which is why we call them natural infrastructure, even though mostly they have parking lots and roads over top of them. The next photo, uh, this one is actually of a what's called a bioretention facility that my team helped build in Mississauga uh, along Elm Drive in partnership with Peel District School Board and the city. Um, so bioretention, you ever hear this word? It's a fancy word for rain garden. Um, so the idea is the same. You have catch basins on the road over here, water hits them, goes into a pipe, but it enters into these gardens before it leaves and goes into the sewer network, which brings it to uh, the local waterway. Um, and this facility I'll be talking about a little bit later. Uh, finally, we have a green roof, and this photo is of a green roof. Um, this picture was taken uh, uh, at Lakeside Park in Mississauga. Uh, and you can see this green roof is unique because they actually have trees on it. So this thing has been around for a while and it's proven to be very effective. Okay, so now I'm just gonna briefly describe my team and give you a short description of what we do to help address the problems that I've been talking about. So there we are, that's my team. You can see me here. Here's my supervisor, whose name is also Kyle. Uh, we have four Kyles at Credit Valley Conservation. It's the most common name in the organization, and I never thought I'd be able to say that. Um, so that's our team. This picture was taken in Brampton at a public school called Glendale Public School. Uh, and this was after we had our planting day. So we go around to public schools uh, in, Peel, in Peel region, uh, and we build rain gardens for them. This is something we've been doing for a couple of years now, and we've got a number of them planned for the years to come. Um, these the facilities are great. We get the students to design them with us. Um, they wanted a fish. So you can see here the outdoor classroom area. There's the fish's tail and its head is down here. Um, and they help us to plant them and these are really happy, positive events. We were all very tired in this picture because it was a long day. Um, and yeah, so that's uh, us after planting a rain garden. So what do we do? We research, we test and build natural infrastructure for stormwater management across the watershed and beyond. We train stormwater professionals in natural infrastructure technology. So we've gone out to Edmonton and Vancouver and a bunch of other places to help teach people how to design, build, and maintain natural infrastructure. We also build software tools and create guidance materials for stormwater professionals. So that's most, uh, most of what we do is directed at engineers and consultants and municipal staff. Okay, so I just want to bring up this image again because uh, it's important to understand that these areas that don't really have much by way of stormwater management, if any at all, you can see the scale of the problem. It, it's most of our urban area does not have stormwater management controls. And tackling this problem requires breaking it down to smaller chunks. So what I'm gonna do now is talk about some components of this light gray area that my team is working with homeowners, with professional associations,
associations uh, and with municipalities to try We just lost you there for a second, Kyle. Uh, I believe you are on mute right now. We'll just give him a couple minutes. I think he might have some Wi-Fi difficulties. There he is. You're just on mute too. Yeah. We just lost okay, you there so for a you, second, Kyle. You can, you can hear me now? We can hear you. Okay, I think I'm, I'm muted. No worries. This is what happens. Okay, so you're doing things are better. Yeah, it's it's, it's part of life. <laughs> it says you're still muted, but I can hear you. I wonder if uh, participants could just type in the chat if they can still hear Kyle. And uh, if maybe you what I'll do is I'll turn my video off. Sure, sure thing. Um, that might improve things. Yeah, Janet says she can hear you. Yeah. So, yep. So everyone. Okay, can so hear you. I can. I should start going. Okay, good. All right. Sorry, everybody. This is part of life these days. Uh, it sure is. It's uh, something we all have to deal with as we as we work and uh, talk to each other from home. Okay. So I just wanted to bring up this map again to show you the scale of the issue. All this area, as I said, most of it doesn't have meaningful stormwater management controls. And part of tackling a problem this size is breaking it down. So I want to talk about three different land use types and how my team has been working and doing research to improve stormwater management for these land use types. And they are residential houses, roads, and industrial, commercial, and institutional properties. Um, let me make sure, okay, there we go, okay. So, Houses, so residential houses, suburban houses, they generate runoff from the roofs, driveways, and other hard surfaces. And moreover, water use on these properties for irrigation, for watering their lawns and watering their gardens is quite high. So one thing we've been doing over the last five years is developing a partnership with Landscape Ontario to create the Fusion Landscape Professional Program. Uh, what this program does is we give training to landscape landscapers in how to build, design, maintain natural infrastructure. And we teach them how to design landscapes to have these features. Um, if you're at all interested in, you know, get, getting this sort of thing done at your home, I strongly encourage you to go to Landscape Ontario's website uh, and they will be able to, uh, and from there you can get to the Fusion Landscape Professional Program. So that's one way that we're starting to tackle the problem of stormwater runoff from houses. Um, okay, so next, roadways. So again, that light gray area, there's different land use types. One of those major land uses that has a lot of hard surface are our municipal roads, regional roads, and provincial highways. So the image you see here on your left um, is a bioswale. This is actually, this photo is taken by me. It's in the city of, Miss uh, city of Brampton, actually, on Mississauga Road, just north of Queen Street. So if you're ever dropping along there, you'll be able to see this facility. And one of the things we do is we work with municipalities across the province and across Canada to do research on the steps that they're taking to solve their stormwater management problems. And then we take that knowledge and we share it with other municipalities. So the city of Kitchener, for example, they've been building natural infrastructure along with their road reconstruction program since 2016. And what they found is that, you know, what you want to do, because if you have a, a road being built, it's much more cost effective to build natural infrastructure at the same time as when you reconstruct your road. So they've been doing that since 2016. They've done a number of projects. And generally, they've found that adding natural infrastructure to road reconstruction projects only adds three to 6% to total project costs. So it's very cost effective to build natural infrastructure 
when you're also doing another sort of infrastructure retrofit, in this case, retrofitting roads. And the region of Peel is also doing a lot of this work. They currently have about a dozen natural infrastructure facilities built to manage stormwater runoff from roadways. Uh, and there are many more that are planned over the coming years. So the region of Peel is very much picked up on this. And we work very closely with them in figuring out how we're going to make sure that these things are maintained into the future. So another kind of problem area that you get, so land use types, areas without stormwater management, a lot of these areas are owned by industrial, commercial, and institutional properties. So in the city of Mississauga, it's approximately 70% of the total land area is owned by industrial, commercial, and institutional landowners. So institutions could be schools, uh, universities, things like that. And industrial, commercial, those are you know, strip malls and places that make pipes, stuff like that. So the city came up with a stormwater credit program to incentivize these landowners to retrofit their, uh, air, their, their properties with stormwater management. This is a very positive step. Uh, and I can't emphasize uh, enough how much good the city of Mississauga stormwater charging credit program is doing. Um, this swale that you see here in the image on the left, this is a bio swale, and this is actually on a property in South Mississauga that my team helped build in around 2010. So we actually work directly with landowners to build these things on their properties and to help them understand how much it costs and how to build and maintain them. One kind of exciting thing that we're doing, or it's exciting to me, uh, is we're working with the city to explore shared natural infrastructure between ICNI landowners and the city. So these facilities would be along roadways and they would treat stormwater from roadways and also from industrial and commercial properties. So this is another thing that we're really hoping that we can investigate in the future with our partners in the private sector and our partners in the public sector. Okay, so next I'm actually going to take us over to the city of Edmonton. So one of the things that I've been spending a lot of time doing lately is writing a series of case studies about how municipalities across Canada have been building the business case for widespread stormwater infrastructure, uh, natural stormwater infrastructure. Um, the image that you're seeing here, this is taken in Edmonton along White Mud Drive, uh, and you can see they had a substantial flooding event there. So there's cars underwater, the highway is blocked off, uh, it causes big problems and Edmonton has a lot of issues with flooding caused by very high intensity storms, so big summer thunderstorms uh, regularly cause flooding in Edmonton. And the issue that happens with this is that all of this rain comes at once and it overwhelms the sewer systems because they weren't designed to take in all those flows. So speaking about Canada broadly, so across Canada, between 2003 and 2012, urban flooding caused about $20 billion in insured damage. Uh, and it's the most expensive kind of flooding and it's the most expensive type of natural, uh, natural, natural hazard uh, that causes damages. So flood damages are going up across the country um, and urban flooding, so when water overwhelms sewer systems is the main culprit for this. So what I wanna do now is just talk very briefly about what the city of Edmonton is doing to tackle its urban flooding problem and how it's using natural infrastructure to, to, to alleviate this problem. So Equor is a private uh, public utility and it operates Edmonton's stormwater system. They actually looked at two options to reduce urban flooding. One which used traditional gray infrastructure so when somebody in stormwater says gray infrastructure, they mean catch basins, pipes, stormwater ponds, you know, oil and grit separators, and these other sorts of things. So they evaluated one option which used just gray infrastructure and one which used natural infrastructure as a key component. So the cost to actually build the traditional infrastructure option, this is across the whole city, it would have been between 2.2 and $4.6 billion, depending on a couple of factors. However, the cost for the option, which uses natural infrastructure, only came in at $1.6 billion. And the main reason for why this, this option was cost so much less than the traditional gray infrastructure option is because it used natural infrastructure. 
And I don't want to get into details now because I think I have about 10 minutes left. But basically, the $470 million they spent on natural infrastructure in their plan, this is a 20 year plan, meant that they didn't have to do a whole bunch of things with their pipes. Um, so, the city of Edmonton, they're taking on a leadership role uh, in, 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 in natural infrastructure world. And they've come up with a very good plan to combat urban flooding uh, in their city. Okay, so those couple slides are just meant to show you, you know, what municipalities are doing for widespread green, infra, uh, green stormwater infrastructure. So those natural infrastructure techniques that I discussed earlier. We've got cities building a lot of natural infrastructure to manage roadways, and we've got the city of Edmonton that's using natural infrastructure for uh, urban flooding prevention. Next, I wanna talk about some additional benefits of natural infrastructure. So putting stormwater management aside, what other benefits do you get from building things like rain gardens in urban areas? So the first thing that I'm going to talk about is the urban heat island effect. So you can see here, this line represents temperature. So the temperature is over here in Celsius. And basically in a rural area, you'll get temperatures about two, three, even four degrees Celsius lower than you will temperatures in areas that are heavily developed. And the reason for this is because these heavily developed areas don't have much vegetation. So the sun just hits the roads, for instance, the roads get very warm. Uh, and this makes it the temperature in the air, the temperatures that we experience much hotter. So, what we do with natural infrastructure, because it uses plants and soils to store stormwater, is we reduce the temperature in urban areas that are otherwise very hot. So you'll remember I talked about our fancy rain garden on Elm Drive earlier, that's on the right. This is the, an, another image of the same facility taken with a thermal camera. So you can see the road surface, uh, the sidewalk surface, pardon me, is 32.5 degrees Celsius. You go over to the bioretention facility, the rain garden, that's what the, this guy here, and it's 20.9 degrees Celsius, Celsius, significantly cooler. And I'll also point out these trees in the background are straight up blue. Trees do a lot of good for reducing urban heat islands. Uh, and one big thing that municipalities these days are trying to do is build a lot more or build, plant a lot more trees to get these benefits, so to reduce the urban heat island is one of the reasons why you get big tree planting plants in municipalities these days. Okay, so green infrastructure also improves air quality. The, the, the leaves intercept what's called particulate matter. Um, and particulate matter is a problem because you can breathe it in, it gets into your lungs, it dumps things up. On your left, you see an urban road without green infrastructure. And on the right, you see an urban road with green infrastructure. So you can see red is bad and blue is good. There's a lot more blue on the street in the same street that has natural infrastructure. So this is another reason why we should be building this sort of stuff because it, it, it natural infrastructure, especially stuff with vegetation and trees in it, does a whole lot of good for reducing urban heat island effect and improving air quality. There's a number of other things that it also does. Uh, but I think uh, I'll leave that for now and maybe that will be for a future webinar. Okay, so now I want to bring it back to Credit Valley Conservation and to give you some resources for how you can help to improve your property stormwater management potential. So the first program that we run that I'll speak to here is called Your Green Yard. Um, they have a number of upcoming webinars. Often these things are done in person. Obviously they're not being done in person now. They have a webinar in the spring, that's on Saturday, May the 1st from 9.30 to 11.30 a.m. Uh, and you can sign up for that by going to this link here. So cbc.ca slash events. They also have a fall webinar uh, and that's on Saturday, September 18th from 9.30 to 11.30 a.m. So it will help you get in your yard ready for spring or fall maintenance or winter. Um, also, you know, watch out if you want for summer garden tours, if COVID-19 safety, safety protocols allow for it. Um, Melanie Kramer, she's the main person over there at Your Green Yard. She also publishes a monthly newsletter called The Garden Post. It's a really good resource, you know, for figuring out um, 
among, for figuring out, you know, how to do sustainable landscaping using rain gardens, how to plant gardens for pollinators, as well as garden care tips. So, you know, while you're at home, what better time to describe to this monthly newsletter? Um, you know, if people are spending a lot of time outdoors at their houses, you might want to take a look at it in this one to see how you can make it more pretty and more functional. Okay, so Greening Corporate Grounds is another or, uh, program run by CDC, and it helps businesses and institutions build resilient and beautiful landscapes through sustainable landscaping and green infrastructure projects on their property. So, you know, you get in touch with Greening Corporate Grounds on the CDC website. Uh, if you own a business, they'll go to your site, they'll figure out what a sustainable action plan for your site. Uh, they'll connect you with other stewardship and educational uh, opportunities. And a lot of what they do is go in and remove invasive species, you know, spray invasive species to get rid of them. And then they plant, you know, native trees, shrubs, and wildflowers. Um, they also help with stormwater management. So we work together, my team and the Green Corporate Grounds team, uh, to help landowners improve stormwater management on their properties. Um, so if you want to learn more about how you can improve uh, your house's landscaping, uh, just go to cbc.ca backslash landscaping. You'll find plant lists, how-to guides, and fact sheets. There's a lot of good information there, and I, I encourage you to, to look it up. Okay, um, so yeah, now we are ready for questions. Maybe I'll turn my video on. Wonderful. Uh, I'll try to figure yeah. out how to turn my video on. There I am. <laughs> that was a great right. presentation, Kyle. Thank you so much for doing that. That was wonderful. Um, so we do have some questions coming in now, um, okay. and uh, I will bring them up for you. Um, the first one's coming in from Janet, and she is saying, I am in Erin Mills. Please advise who I should contact to get a rainwater garden. Oh, okay. So um, we give you the link here. I can put it in the chat. Um, oh, oh, sorry, I've ended the show. Okay. Um, so if you want to get a rain garden, this is the per this is the webinar to go to. It's on May 1st from 9.30 to 11. You go to cdc.ca slash events. Maybe we can put that in the chat. Um, and uh, yeah, you, you can sign up there. The contact person is Melanie Kramer. She's great. Um, also, you can look up the garden posts and that will give you tips on how to build a rain garden on your own. If you're looking for a little bit more detail on how to do it, you go to one of these webinars. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you, Janet. I'll try to get that in the chat as well. Um, another question coming from Derek. What is the expected effect of climate change on precipitation in the region and the subsequent effect on stormwater management? Ah, yes, very good question. Um, this is actually quite complicated because if you look at Environment Canada data, uh, and a lot of people have, um, we haven't seen any increases in the intensity of storms in Southern Ontario specifically. On the West Coast in BC, yes. On the East Coast in the Atlantic provinces, yes. Um, all, it's very much predicted by our climate change models that as the temperature warms up, it can hold more moisture and it will drop more moisture and that will get longer droughts and more intense storms. Um, this, this is a prediction that has yet to come true in Ontario. Um, so just, um, yeah, that's something to watch. You know, if we get very intense storms, I mean, part of the issue is we get very intense storms now, they're called a one in 100 year storm. The worry is a one in 100 year storm will become a one in 50 year storm. Um, and our stormwater infrastructure is designed according to the level of storm it's meant to handle. So those simple sewer systems I pointed out before, they're only designed for five or 10 year storms. Um, and in suburban areas where we actually do have stormwater ponds, better stormwater controls, they're built for a hundred year storms. But if we start getting 200 year storms, more frequently, that's a big problem because it will overwhelm every sewer system uh, across the province. So yeah, thank you for your question. It's a very good one. Question. Um, Judy asks, my house uh, roof drains go directly into the sewer system. Can I disconnect them and just let them drain onto my property? And is there something I need to do about the existing drain connection? Yes, so um, where are you, Judy, if I can ask? I believe she's somewhere in Mississauga. 
You're somewhere in Mississauga? Okay, so um, tell you what, if you can give Stephanie- Oakville, sorry. Your, Oakville, okay. Oh, you're in Oakville. Okay, yeah, give, give, uh, give Stephanie your email address. She'll give it to me. Um, most municipalities have downspout disconnection programs. So if you want to disconnect your downspout, they'll come to your house and do it. <laughs> um, it actually, disconnecting your downspout is the most cost-effective stormwater ma management measure out there because all you're doing is you're putting on an additional pipe so it doesn't go straight into the sewer system. Um, and you know it slows the water down quite a bit before it reaches the sewer system. So it's very much a positive thing. So yeah, Stephanie will give me your email address and I'll try to look up resources for you in the city of Oakville and I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Okay, and uh, Janet has just chimed in too. She would like the email for the downspout disconnecting info as well. So okay. um, Kyle, I wonder if I could put your email in the chat. Is that okay? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah put it in there and then uh, Judy and Janet send me an email and I'll... I'll do some quick internet searches and I'll try to find programs. For you. Wonderful. And I am just checking Facebook. There's no questions on Facebook. I have my own question for you. Okay. Um, so there is a town north of Mississauga that um, right now there is a wastewater treatment center going in. And no. there's a lot of pushback saying that it is. Uh, bad for our trout and salmon species that are in the Credit River. So yeah. I'm just wondering if that is uh, a correct thing or if it's just kind of a... Yeah, so part of the issue that we face as an organization is that people need houses. <laughs> and it's very difficult as we're finding to work with our current government to get those houses built in urban areas that already exist. So we kind of have to put in wastewater treatment plants because the houses are going in anyways. Um, water coming out of wastewater treatment plants can be made cool. Um, you can cool it down and wastewater treatment plants are very effective these days at removing pollutants from stormwater. So is it ideal? I'm not sure. I, I, just, I don't do wastewater really. I'm kind yeah. of speaking for myself here uh, and not Credit Valley Conservation as an organization. Um, but yeah, I mean, people are right to be concerned, but we're doing our absolute best to make sure that we protect the West Credit tributary. And okay, and one more question from Janet. Perfect. She's a member of the Blooming Boulevards. I don't know if you've heard them, of them before, Kyle. They're a really great organization. Um, okay. They do some webinars through us as well. Um, yeah. And she said, it would be great to have more pollinator plants in the rainwater gardens. Is that a, a thing? Do you put pollinator plants in there as well for bees and butterflies or? Yeah, yeah. Whenever we build a, a rain garden or a bioretention facility, as they're often called in, in our business, uh, we, we plant them with native species with the aim of providing habitat for insects, birds, and even small mammals in some cases, if we're building a, you know, putting in oak trees or something like that. So yes, definitely that's something that we, we do, yeah. Awesome. Okay, and if we have any more questions coming in, we'll give it one minute here. Okay. Will, uh, Sonia asked, will these resources be available after the program? Yeah, so you can actually email me. I'll put my email in as well and I can supply all of um, Kyle's resources today. I'll put it in the chat here. I don't know if we are getting any others. Um, so Kyle, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Um, uh, if you do, if any other questions come through, I will send them your way through email if that works for you. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us as well. And uh, thank you, Climate Impact, for funding our green webinars that are happening all throughout March and April, and also CVC for supporting all of our programs. Once again, if you have financial means to support us, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, but otherwise, Kyle, if you have anything last to say, that is it from us. Oh. I hope I, I hope you learned something. <laughs> it was a great presentation. Uh, th thanks for coming, everybody. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Okay. Have a great afternoon. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye.